Hi there, I'm Don Mino, and tonight we're going to talk about a device that it means a lot to someone like myself. A lot of the, every street corner in America seemed to have one, and it was really, really a lot of fun and also very valuable. I'm talking about the pay telephone booth. That was a device, of course, uh, Bell invented the telephone back in the 19th century, but his first models were very, very, very crude. They had a shout into them, and his assistant, uh, Dr. Watson, they, they woke up half the neighborhood doing their experiments. But they were determined to get something that would work and be understood. But uh, they took a long, long, long time. They wanted to send, uh, set up a phone, let's say, in a downtown area so that people that needed help could call or perhaps if they were traveling. But it took uh, a lot of doing. Actually, Dr. Watson, I didn't realize this until I started studying it, he actually invented the first telephone booth, but you had a little plate over the phone and you were standing outside and you were ready to have all the dirt and noise and everything coming right at you. So that didn't work. But finally in 1905, the Bell Company built one. They put it in Cincinnati, but it wasn't much better. They had screens on it, but you were standing in mud, so just not, not a lot of excitement right there. But what happened in 1912, the Bell Company came up with a model called the Model Number 1, and that one they lasted about 40 years. Now, the picture you can see, it became a fun thing to have around, to know where the nearest phone was. And you'll see in the picture of the uh, youngsters stuffing themselves into a phone booth, and uh, that was quite a contest. Now, that picture is from the 50s, but certainly in the 1920s, the flapper era and so forth, they stuffed as many as they could into it. It was a contest thing. And that's, <laughs> I can think of better things. I suppose go eating goldfish would probably be uh, less desirable. But uh, it was a popular item. And, of course, Hollywood had a lot of fun with uh, the telephone booth. I mean, picture Oliver Hardy getting stuck in the door or any of the other oversized uh, comedians, or even not so oversized. And don't forget Hollywood's dramatic movies. Now, people that know me know I love the uh, 30s and 40s film noir things. And the phone booth, uh, you know, you got the, the uh, criminal there in his office, always fancy, always called boss and all. And he has a little, his little partner he sends out on a thing. Maybe his name was probably something like Binky or, or Blinky or something. And Blinky staggers to a phone booth and says, Boss, I found out who the, who the guy is. It's uh, this guy or that guy. And as soon as he does that, the big black sedan comes around the corner and demolishes the phone booth. So I think Hollywood and the phone company, they had dummy phones that weren't real phones. They had a bunch of those, and I'm sure they went through an awful lot of them. But uh, it was something. Now, Bell Company was quite insistent. They wanted to make sure that phones uh, were clean and uh, germ-free and that they worked and they looked nice. Now, the other picture I brought is the picture of the telephone booth and the car, if we could see that. And that, those are later phone booths. Those are after uh, the early 50s, but it's still the same idea. They wanted to know that if you were going to visit Aunt Susie somewhere and you're 50 miles away in this picture and you had some car trouble or the, some of the children were sick or whatever it might be, that you could reassure her and that the phone would be a big help. And also, maybe if you had somebody that you couldn't stop on this particular trip, but you wanted them to know you were in the area, you could call them there. And of course, the obvious one, repairs. And that would be something special also. Uh, the car, incidentally, I, I'm quite interested in prices of the old cars. That's a 1955 Dodge four-door V8 and something like that, $2,200 in that ballpark. That's amazing considering what they are now. But this is how Bell Company wanted the phone set up, right? Attractive, maybe in, in national parks, certainly in grocery stores. And I think one of the most comfortable things that... Uh, I would sit in, if you get a nice hotel or a fancy store and you go into the uh, phone booth, you flip the wooden door and it knocked down quite a bit of the sound level from outside and a dome lamp, usually about nine inches in diameter, came uh, shining right on you and you had a fan you could put on and the phones were quiet and uh, that's what Bell wanted. And the original phones were five cents for local calls. but. Uh, they didn't change the phones too much, this model number one that went from the teens right up through the 50s. And what they did do, they had to make it bigger a couple of times. 
because the people were getting bigger, <laughs> so they made him taller. But as they developed the uh, phone area there, they decided that they could put glass around the bottom to keep the noise level down because that was a problem. And also they had a small roof on them. They made it a little bit bigger so that the phone wouldn't get wet and you wouldn't get wet. But they put the... Uh, the phone out there so that uh, people could use it but their phones got better as time went by but uh, it's just uh, hilarious the way they uh, t took care of uh, people and they, the phones were nice and clear anyway by, by, by the time the 50s came by but then what they did later is that they started having problems with vandalism this was in the late 50s early 60s and they decided then they had to go to shatterproof glass and things of that sort. And it became difficult. One year, New York City reported that 35,000 phones were not working. And that's hard to imagine, but it was cost millions of dollars to get them going. But Bell Company was insistent that they wanted to be able to offer people a quality product. But they, without the phones, they eliminated the booth, and they had a the doorway, and the phone against a wall, and that helped a little bit. But it was again it became noisy. People also valued their privacy, and all through the life of the outdoor phone, whether it's a booth or not, the people didn't want other people hearing their business, and it was also tough to stand out in the rain and get a phone. But you just don't see the pay phones anymore because the cell phones uh, do a much better job and you don't have to, to worry about anybody hearing you. But uh, it's just an awful lot of fun. But to sit in a phone booth and a nice comfortable plastic seat, a corrugated wall, uh, picking up the phone. And initially they had the ones with the separate earpiece and the separate mouthpiece, but then they put everything all in one. But it was quite a treat. And uh, it's really interesting stuff to to see, but they just now with the cell phone, you just don't uh, just don't need them. But it's just a long and healthy life, and Hollywood should write a thank you note to the phone company because I, you just can picture people getting taken, phone booths being put being pulled down the street by a car or whatever it might be, and it was just made for the criminal thing. And something else though, in the first Superman movie. As Christopher Reeve is trying to rescue Lois and the helicopter, and he goes down to the first floor, out to the street, and there's no phone booth. There's a phone against a wall. Rather difficult. So he had to go to the building next door to use his phone and change into Superman. Actually, they always make a big thing about Superman going into a phone booth. I think he did in the first few comic books in the late 30s, but he really didn't do it. He went into the storeroom, but... Uh, it's <laughs> just interesting. I suppose he has to change someplace. But uh, it was a different era, and uh, it was just a lot of uh, fun to remember. And this is Don Mino, and uh, we share thoughts together, and uh, thanks for listening. <laughs>